Hey everyone, welcome back to Let's Play Kirby Nightmare in Dreamland, and this is the finale, this is a two-part odyssey, uh, hope you had fun! <laughs> but last time, I managed to wax nostalgia about not just classic Kirby games, but also my experiences with Kirby in the past. And perhaps we can use this part to talk more about the more recent Kirby adventures, although the last part was really general. Before we talk about all that, though, uh, we're starting off a yogurt yard. So there are seven main worlds in Kirby's Adventure, or Kirby Nightmare in Dreamland, which this is a remake of, so... This is a remake of Kirby's Adventure, I should say. And... Each of the main areas has a boss fight and all that stuff, you know. And that's basically... I, most 2D platforming Kirby games have about six or seven worlds. But how long or how many levels they may have, it can, it can vary. We'll say that much. Uh, is it one of these penguins that gives the ice ability? Because I'm not even sure. I, you know, I've only been paying attention most of the time, funnily enough. But I don't think I've gotten the ice power yet. It'd be funny if it turned out that Ice wasn't even in this game, it was in Kirby Superstar. Wouldn't be the first time I made that mistake. Hello, bomb. Yeah. That's all there is to say about that, but... Yogurt Yard actually has, like, one of my favorite music tracks in the entire series. It's like, dum da dum da dum da dum I just like that opening bit. Uh, the boss fight isn't gonna be a lot to write home about, though. It's, uh, well, we'll get to it when we get to it, but, um... Yeah, you know, Kirby Nightmare in Dreamland. I had a lot of fun with this game back in the day. Uh, it made for a pretty great but interesting Christmas time in December of 2002. I'm pretty sure this came out exactly then. Or if it didn't come out then, it might have been like a month or two earlier. But either way, it was an interesting Christmas season for me as I remember because I remember getting this, and I also remember getting the GBA port of Legend of Zelda A Link to the Past. And what's interesting about that is that A Link to the Past is a game that released a year after I was born, so I was way too young to be able to appreciate it. I didn't even get into Zelda, really, until I was about 10 years old. With uh, Majora's Mask, actually. That is going a little off topic. I'm just mentioning it for the sake of it. But, yeah, it made for a pretty interesting Christmas season to have a remake of an NES game that I did play, and then a port of a Super Nintendo game that I did not play, but I had gotten into the Zelda series, so by that point, I was pretty much going for, like, every Zelda game I could get my hands on, because I was just so into the series at that time. And Kirby, well, I would say Nightmare in Dreamland was the start of me keeping up with the Kirby releases as they came out for the most part. Uh, the only Kirby releases I actually kind of skipped out on, starting from that era, was, uh, Kirby Canvas Curse. I distinctly remember not getting when it launched because, uh, the control... I don't know if it was the control scheme or the concept that turned me off, or if I couldn't find the game, or something like that. In retrospect, I seem to remember that game not getting a very good print run. Not, not a lot of copies. I actually remember that game being kind of expensive on the second-hand market for a while. For all I know, it might have gone up since then. Kirby Canvas Curse is a game that I wound up appreciating a, a lot later on after its original release in 2005. Okay. Uh, but yeah, I skipped out on that. I did get Kirby Squeak Squad, and funnily enough, I remember enjoying Squeak Squad quite a bit. But it seems like, in retrospect, a lot of people were not favorable to it, because of, it, of how samey it is, I guess, and stuff like that. I'm just like, you know, a lot of Kirby games are pretty samey, for the most part. It's just that, going from Dreamland 1 to Kirby's Adventure, you had the addition of the copy abilities. From Adventure to Superstar, you had, like, all of the extra modes, and the copy abilities got expanded. And, you know, like, Kirby Superstar, in a lot of ways, was kind of the peak of that formula for quite a while, because after that, we had Dreamland 2, well, actually, Dreamland 2 and 3 had a much more simple copy ability system in retrospect, I would say. And it actually had less copy abilities than Kirby's Adventure in general, I'm pretty sure. 
It was Kirby 64 that changed things up, because Kirby 64 actually, um, had a mix. You could mix up copy abilities and make new combinations, which is something that the series has never really gone back to do for the most part, with the exception of, funny enough, Squeak Squad, which didn't do it to the same depth. You could, like, get... You could mix, like, fire, ice, and electricity, or spark, with, like, hammer, bomb, and sword, or something like that, so... Kinda brought it back, but not all the way. But it didn't really advance the formula, it was more of a pivot. So, you go years and years, and it's just like, okay, we got Squeak Squad, and then a couple years after Squeak Squad, hey, let's remake Superstar for the Nintendo DS! And it's just like, okay, that, that worked out really well. So, I mean, whatever. And I say whatever, but actually Superstar Ultra is arguably one of the best, if not the best, Kirby game ever made. But, I don't know. My opinion is that a lot of the newer Kirby games, like after Return to Dreamland, are better. I had a lot more fun with them overall. But Superstar Ultra definitely has content. And uh, it might actually have that distinction over the other games in terms of raw content. There's a lot to go off of in Superstar Ultra. There's a lot to do. A lot of replay value. Matter of fact, I might be overdue for a replay. That's uh, neither here nor there. Anyway, um, yeah, I, I did say I was going to try and focus more on my time with the Kirby games, the newer ones, since I did a lot of wax nostalgia. So, by the time I got to the newer Kirby games, the Kirby comics kind of dwindled a little bit. I got better with drawing, but I kind of drifted away from making the comics. I still doodled in school, though. So, a lot of the concepts I was coming up with were still alive in my mind, obviously. It's just that a lot of them weren't being made to print. I had a very funny way of making comics, too. I actually would use, like, yarn to tie, tie together the pieces of paper with the holes in them. Or, you know, I could have just used printer paper with, like, a hole punch. But I found that when I was making comics, I actually liked using regular notebook paper because of the lines. It really helps with the organization and keeping, trying to keep all of the characters, like, on point as much as possible. You know, that's something very difficult about animation that I would say is trying to keep all of the frames and animation and character, like dimensions consistent so whenever i see people criticizing a show about not being able to keep characters on model i just try to think back to my time doing those comics and drawing and i i, I just i really feel for them honestly because i imagine it's what i was dealing with but on a much greater level especially if it's something you depend on to make a living instead of just something i did on the side or you did on the side yeah so here's another pretty epic uh, Kirby's Adventure for Nightmare Energy Line boss. Uh, Burning Leo, I think it's called. And because it's called Burning Leo, of course you get burning and not fire. So that makes sense. I don't think Burning Leo comes back after this game or whatever, you know. But, yeah. So, slowly but surely, over the years, I did keep up with the Kirby releases for the most part. I skipped Canvas Curse. I never really went back to Air Ride all that much. Um, believe it or not, I didn't skip Mass Attack, but... <laughs> so here's the problem with Kirby Mass Attack. Uh, it released the same year as the 3DS, which I I'll admit, the only reason I got a 3DS when it was in the release year, honestly, is that yeah, I was able to get this really good deal uh, if you were, if you got the 3DS early, you would become a Nintendo 3DS ambassador, and you would, you would get a bunch of GBA and NES games for free by buying 3DS. However, Walmart was doing this deal, like, where you could get the 3DS at the newer price they were trying to do, and still get the ambassador, because they were, they were doing the price, like, almost a week before the actual date of the price change. I'm not going to go into too much detail about the drama of Nintendo not really getting the price of the 3DS right, and they had to kind of correct it. Uh, I would suggest you try to Google and look that up on your own time, but... 
what matters is that because of that, I wound up getting the 3DS in retrospect probably about half a year or even a full year early. And Kirby Mass Attack released about a month or two after I got that 3DS. I did get the game, but unfortunately, my interest in time was being spent on other games at the time. Not even just, like, the 3DS. I had other DS games I was getting into around then, too. Uh, Pokemon Black and White blew me away. I wouldn't be surprised if I was replaying the game by that point. But, yeah, there was that. And then there was uh, this game called Dragon Quest Monsters Joker 2. Not Joker 1. Like, I come completely blew past Joker 1. Just Joker 2 came out, I don't know what gravitated me towards it, but I felt like grabbing it, playing it, and I had a great time. Beat that game to death. And that's probably why I didn't uh, play much of Kirby Mass Attack. There was also uh, Fossil Fighters Champions, I think. A se the sequel to Fossil Fighters, which is another really cool DS game that you probably know about. You may not know about the sequel, but you probably know about the original because a certain YouTuber named Jaden Animations talked about it. And made the value of the game skyrocket, and I regret that I had sold it earlier and not after the fact. At any rate, we move on to level 6, Orange Ocean. It's a pretty chill world, but it also starts to get really difficult around this point. This is also where we're going to be fighting Meta Knight. Now, I, I didn't admit, now be fair, it's not that much of a spoiler because it was alluded to with all the Meta Knight fights. This is the second to last world because I said there are seven main worlds, and you assume you're going to fight DDD at the end, or close to the end. You know this, it's not that big of a spoiler, but if you are offended, do post in the comments how offended you are, because, did you know, comments are good for the YouTube algorithm. Also, the enemies are still changing color. I don't remember them changing color so much. Like, how did the burning enemies go from red to blue? That doesn't really even really make much sense. But, you know, it's whatever. So, yeah, what's a doozy? But at any rate, uh, going back to the discussion of how what, what, what I was doing when all these newer Kirby games are coming out. Yeah, Mass Attack... I think I just made it to, like, the second world. Apparently, that one only has four worlds, but they have, like, ten levels. And I'm also going to point it out here for the record, just for people's curiosity. Curry Mass Deck is a game that I tried to record, not just for Loose Goose, but also for uh, my previous channel, Temple of the Azure Flame. I attempted to record the game twice and just lost interest both times, because... It's similar to Kirby Canvas Curse, and you know, it's also kind of similar to Pikmin in a way. So you would think that I really like the game because of all that, but thing about it is, Canvas Curse, I don't necessarily like Canvas Curse because of its control scheme, believe it or not. I actually like Canvas Curse because of its music and its level structure, and the way that the gameplay is organized, you know. Because you go through a few levels, and then you go... And when you get to a boss, you can actually choose between three different bosses. And each of those bosses has two levels. So you, every playthrough, you can do the bosses in a different order. Stuff like that really makes me appreciate the game more. And even with my, honestly, mostly minor gripes with the control scheme, which I usually get around with, I mean, I'm, I'm used to playing the game with a mouse. I play it on emulator. I haven't... I think I did play Canvas Curse on original hardware for a time, because I did have a physical copy for a little bit, and maybe after I had done the first long play I did for Temple of the Azure Flame, maybe I did try to play it just to get an appreciation for it when I was bored? I don't know. But, um, either way, Mass Attack is sadly going to be like one of those Kirby games that if I might not ever get around to, I hope to, but... Between that and, like, Kirby Air Ride and all the Game Boy games like Kirby Block Ball and Pinball Land, I'm not... I'm not particularly motivated to do any of those, you know? But I do think it'd be nice if eventually I could get most, if not all, of the Kirby games available for viewing. It's just that it wouldn't really be all that reflective of my history to just do every single one. Because the truth of the matter is, I didn't even play every single Kirby game when they were new. I'm actually going to go back to the past a little bit, because I actually forgot about this game. I'm 
surprise. Uh, Kirby Tilt and Tumble for the Game Boy Color was a game that I did know about, but I skipped, probably because Game Boy Color, I wasn't that into handhelds in the Game Boy era, mostly just Pokemon and then one or two other games like Super Mario Land 2. But Kirby Tilt and Tumble, I don't know, it was it just felt like a hard skip for me. And it still kind of is, because I don't even know how I could record that game for the channel, considering its unique control scheme. I was able to do WarioWare Twisted, though, so it kind of makes you wonder. Yeah, it kind of used like a gyroscope control scheme or something crazy like that. Oh wow, a pink and red bomber. That's... that's interesting. Yeah, I still don't know why the enemies are changing colors so much. I don't know if that's like a regional thing. Maybe I was playing like a, a European version of this game or something. That's why everything's all cuckoo god. I don't, I don't get it. Eh, it's not that big of a deal either way. But, um... Oh, I didn't even... Ne I neglected to mention the boss of Yogurt Yard is Heavy Mole. Yeah, it's not really... Heavy Mole is, is one of those bosses where... As long as you're attacking early on as much as you can before, like, the ground crumbles beneath you, you can get in a lot of damage with Hammer and defeat Heavy Mole really quickly. So I guess that's kind of why I just overlooked it. We are getting to use Laser, though, so that's kind of neat. And this puzzle's a little on the tricky side, though. You can't just go down through the platform like you can in Smash Brothers. You actually have to go... Uh, out and then under the platform yourself. Kind of annoying, but I think they fixed that in the later Kirby games. I'm not 100% sure. I mean, there's also to make a distinction between platforms that are solid and ones that are not as solid. The ones that aren't as solid should be the ones you can go through, but it did look like one of those kind of platforms. I don't know. But either way, let's go back to the discussion of the you were Kirby and whatnot. I know I, I know I backtracked to Kirby Tilt and Tumble, but we're gonna tilt and tumble back to the more current discussion. So after Kirby Mass Attack, well actually the funny thing about Mass Attack is that Mass Attack also came out the same year as Return to Dreamland. Actually only a couple, not even a couple months? I think it was like a month and a half before Return to Dreamland came out. And it's understandable why they were doing it, because uh, 2011 was before 2012, and 2012 was the 20-year anniversary of Kirby. And they celebrated that with Kirby's Dream Collection, which is a collection that included a bunch of classic games. Basically, it included Dreamland 1, Adventure, Superstar, and then the three games that make up the Dark Matter Trilogy. I don't know, I think I might have accidentally said, like, series or anthology or something last time, but... Yeah, the Dark Matter Trilogy, which consists of Dreamland 2, Dreamland 3, and Kirby 64. The Dream Collection included all of that, and a bunch of other neat extras, including three episodes of the Kirby anime. Kinda makes me wonder why I decided to get rid of my copy of Dream Collection, but... I guess at the end of the day, it just boils down to the fact that... It's mostly filled of games that I either already played a bunch or I have access to in other ways. You know, be it emulation or some of those games are available on Switch now. And I mean, if I'm really not in the mood to play something on PC, which I have to be honest, the only time I do is if I'm recording high quality gameplay for a channel. I'm not doing that. I'd rather would rather play the game for comfort, you know, on TV on an actual console. The Switch has lately been doing pretty decent on it. You can actually play a lot of Kirby games on the Switch, thanks to the retro applications that they have. But that's... I mean, I guess that's kind of on topic, but at the same time, it's not. I'm just saying, but, you know... At any rate, yeah, Kirby Dream Collection was a filler release. It was a pretty good one, though, so... I can't harp on it too much. It was a better collection than the Super Mario... Wii collection, which is basically just a Super Nintendo ROM on a disc, so, you know. But after that, the Kirby series kind of took a break, and then 2014 comes around, and that's when we kind of had a bit of a Kirby renaissance. I would argue that that technically started with Return to Dreamland, but Return to Dreamland had a lot of other stuff going on in between. And by a lot, I mean, yeah, just Dream Collection, but you know. But Triple Deluxe, and also a couple years later, Kirby Planet Robobot, 
were both really fantastic Kirby games. Like, arguably just as good, if not better, definitely better in the case of Planet Robobot compared to Return to Dreamland. Planet Robobot is an amazing Kirby game. And as of the recording of this, they announced Kirby's Return to Dreamland Deluxe for the Switch. It's coming out in a couple of months. And... I, I, I'm just sitting here thinking, man, it would be really nice if they did, like, a Kirby Dream Collection 2 that had Return to Dreamland and the two 3DS games. So when they announced that, I'm like, well, okay, they got one of them. Hopefully they'll do the other two in a collection instead of doing it one at a time, you know? I do kind of feel like Return to Dreamland does kind of stand on its own, partially because it was on Wii and the other two games were on 3DS. Hopefully, because of that connection, we will see the both of them released in a collection. But, honestly, they probably could stand alone because each of them had a couple of pretty meaty side modes to each of them. They kind of continued the Kirby Superstar approach a little bit, which is uh, it's pretty nice, I'm not going to lie. So, you might be wondering why I'm fighting Burning Leo here. Uh, Burning's a pretty good ability. Because of the iframes you get. It's just good for that. And yeah, have to fight it by sucking up stars and throwing them back at it. But, while this is slow, the stars you spit out do do a lot of damage. It basically, it does become like three hits and you're out, like most video game bosses. It's just that sometimes Burning Leo likes to drag things out and may not attack right away. Just tries to be a cute lion. You know, lions are technically related to cats, but I wouldn't want to go near a lion. I wouldn't want to go near a cat either, if I'm going to be perfectly honest. Because I've had negative experiences with cats in the past. And I don't and as far as I'm concerned, cats, the way they treat their owners, it's just it's not healthy. Okay, so I got burning for that wall. That makes a lot of sense. It's also pretty nice that they included an easy way to get burning in Orange Ocean, so you could do that. Yeah, it's actually really neat how they do that. Oh, oh, there's that, there's that Blade Knight. There's UFO again. Obviously, I'm going to take advantage of that whenever I can. UFO is such a great ability. Oh, wow, they really spammed the UFO enemies here. Ooh, Jesus. But yeah, I mean, if you have the UFO ability, it almost kind of becomes a 2D shooter in a way. Because of the way Kirby moves around and you're shooting the projectiles and whatnot. And thankfully, you do keep the ability, like, in between rooms. Double Mr. Frosty! Let's go! Whoa! I actually forgot about this. But, uh, yeah, sometimes you fight more than one boss at a time. Ooh, the epic double kill. Jesus. Yeah, UFO was kind of busted. Did you know? Yeah, well, now you do. Now you can see it plain as day. It's pretty strong. Uh, by the way... Oh, I thought there was, like, something there. It looks like there'd be a door over there, doesn't it? Anyway, uh, another Meta Knight encounter. The last one before we fight him. And just so you know, there won't be any Meta Knight encounters in World 7, because when you defeat him in Orange Ocean... He kind of just backs off, which uh, makes a lot of sense. Uh, because by that point, you've proven your bow. Also means we're going to be losing access to the UFO ability, unfortunately, because the Meta Knight boss fight operates in a very specific way in Kirby Nightmare and Dreamland slash Kirby's Adventure. And, yeah. But, UFO does kind of make it easier to deal with the enemies. So you realize that the platforms in the middle... They'll block your shots unless they're all the way charged. And UFO doesn't stay with you when you leave a world. Which actually makes sense, because UFO would break the overworld navigation by a lot. So, I'm not going to harp on that too much. At any rate, you are forced to collect sword before you can fight Meta Knight. Doesn't mean that this fight's necessarily hard. It just means that you have to fight in a very specific way. And I decided to go for a scrappy approach here, because... Well, even though I went in with only 5 out of 6 health, I still came out on top. Because you're doing a lot of damage, Meta Knight does only the one unit of damage. So You can afford to be scrappy, and I'm pretty sure your health is restored in between worlds. 
Anyways, welcome to level 7, Rainbow Resort. Pretty infamous in the series. I like how it's showing off the mic ability. Oh, you don't get healed in between worlds. Uh, okay, that might be a little awkward. At any rate, uh, Rainbow Resort has a few levels to it. The most interesting level here, though, is the final one. Mostly because it was actually a throwback before throwbacks were cool. What do I mean by that? You'll see what I mean in about, I don't know, like 10 minutes, but... At any rate, this room full of blocks. You can use spark, you can use beam, you can use a lot of different things. I don't know if I would use burning here, though. But these energy drink, those energy drink items do come in handy a lot. So you might not, you get those as soon as you can. They heal your health by two. Yeah, as you can see, spark is knocking out like three lines of blocks at a time. So another annoying thing about Kirby games, mostly the older ones, is that you're gonna have to, you're gonna be dealing with like regenerating enemies a lot. Sometimes it's so bad that you just go like one screen over, not even like completely, just partially one screen over, and then come back, and they'll already be regenerated. It's kind of crazy. But at any rate, that's how you solve that puzzle for the most part. Uh, at first I thought you needed beam, but it turns out, no, you can just use spark, and it works out pretty dang good, to be honest. And I just like freeze, that's why I went out of my way to get freeze. Yeah, I'm starting to think maybe ice isn't in this game. I could have sworn it was, or I just decided not to get it, because freeze... I think freeze in this game is better. I mean, it's pretty good for freezing your enemies and your opponents, or enemies, I should say, yeah. It does a pretty solid job of that. I don't think we can deny it. I also like how Kirby's costume kind of looks like the Ice Climber costume. You know, Ice Climber, the NES game. Also, Ice Climber is the Smash Brothers character that, for, for whatever reason, weren't in Smash Brothers 4. Yes, can, can we just please continue to pretend that that game didn't happen and we just went from Brawl to Ultimate? I think we would all be better for it because... Cutting characters, it's kind of bad. I mean, if you're cutting clone characters, like, from Melee to Brawl, the only really bad cut there was Mewtwo, and even then, wasn't that bad. But the cuts they made from Brawl, Smash 4, and all the excuses, reasons, it's just, eh. All because they wanted to do a dual release on 3DS and Wii U. I'll admit, 3DS one was kind of neat. Of course, the novelty of it is not really there anymore, because Ultimate is on Switch. You, do you know what a Nintendo Switch is? It's a Nintendo handheld and a Nintendo home console, all in one, for just 300 buckaroonies. It's a pretty good deal, if you ask me, especially for the game library. But what do I know? I've only been playing Nintendo since the first one. I mean, I was almost a decade late to the party because of when I was born, but... That's the wonder of used games, of used game consoles, and stuff going on sale. And probably pawn shops here and there, too. Ah, yes, yes. At any rate, uh, there wasn't really a lot going on in my life. By the time the 3DS game started coming out, my young adult life was already in swing, and uh, I don't really feel like commenting on anything that was happening around that time. It's just... Kind of a bit much for me at times, looking back, some of it was kind of painful, but... For the most part, I did keep up with the Kirby releases. It, it seemed to be a lot easier to do so. They weren't really doing a lot of, like, side games as much as they did in the Super Nintendo era. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, I played Triple Deluxe, it was great. I played Planet Robobot, it was better. And after that was Kirby Star Allies, which I played through with my brother on a random visit, and we beat the game in a single four to five hour session. Which is normal for Kirby games, but at the same time, we didn't really like it as much as uh, Kirby's Return to Dreamland, which I believe was the last one we played. So, yeah, we did do that, and we enjoyed that a fair bit, but... Star Allies is not a bad game, but you know, I feel like if people harp on Squeak Squad for being a samey entry, Star Allies is kind of that too. I mean, it introduced some new copy abilities, but then again, so did Squeak Squad. 
Squeak Squad gave us the animal ability, the bubble ability, the metal ability, even though metal is not that great. But that's my point, though. Star Allies introduced some new abilities as well, but the game's performance wasn't great. I mean, like, the technical performance. It, it was a Kirby game, so, like, Kirby games usually run at 60 frames per second, I'm pretty sure. I don't think there's been too many that ran less than that, considering we're talking about a series that was mostly on handhelds, and handheld games were usually 60 frames per second because, well, they're on a handheld. They don't have to worry about uh, TVs, you know? They're just, they have a screen. But, Kirby Star Allies, for some reason, decided to run at 30 frames per second. And I don't think it worked out very well. That game is just feels kind of kind of a slog to play compared to uh, the 3DS games or Return to Dreamland. It's gonna be the funny thing, actually. So when Return to Dreamland Deluxe releases in a few months from the recording of this video, it's probably gonna be the second best Kirby game you can play on the Switch, not counting or factoring in retro applications, because Forgotten Land is an amazing Kirby game. It's also the first one to be a 3D platform instead of a 2D one. And somehow they knocked it out of the park. I, I can't believe that they were able to do it the first time, but my god, they must have been doing some studying on the side in the decades that they kept doing 2D games, you know? And I'm not even jumping ahead that far because actually Forgotten Land was the next major release after Star Allies, so... Forget about Kirby Fighters 2, forget about, like, any of those other... No, I want to skip straight ahead to Forgotten Land and talk about how amazing it is, but only a little bit, because the next Let's Play, next Kirby game Let's Play I plan to do is going to be Forgotten Land. The way our release schedule is, though, I don't know when that'll be released, but I hope it'll be as soon as possible. Uh, I, haven't, I haven't started it yet, but I want to start it pretty soon, because... It's such an amazing game. It's fairly long, so it'll probably be a good bit of content, so that'll be alright. And just, it is a game that legitimately tested me and made me question, well, does this dethrone Kirby 64 as my favorite Kirby game, a position that I held for over two decades before I played Forgotten Land? What was the stance that I settled on? That, I will save for that Let's Play. Look forward to that one of these days, ladies and gentlemen, etc. You know what I mean. Also, wow, I've got over a million points. That's pretty impressive. But at any rate, we are finally on the home stretch here. We're coming up to the level that I was alluding to, and uh, matter of fact, I'm trying to think about it, a lot of these levels in Rainbow Resort are pretty short. I, it makes for a pretty good pace. I wonder if they did this to make, make up for the fact that obviously you're gonna fight the final boss and the final boss is kind of long. I mean, cause you always gotta go, hey look, hey, look at that! Black and white graphics, even though we're on a Game Boy Advance. So here's the fun fact. They do this on Kirby's Adventure as well on the NES. So, even though Kirby's Dreamland was only a year old when Kirby's Adventure came out, probably not even a year old, I, ha I would have to double check release dates not gonna do. <laughs> to do a throwback, back when the ga video game industry was still so new, it was in its infancy, really, was that to do a throwback like this was really novel. Of course, nowadays, I would say like for the last decade plus, throwbacks have been commonplace in most, especially most Nintendo series. Which, you know, it is what it is. Fan service, you know, nod to all of the players who've been playing since the oh, good old days, you know? A lot of us that have gotten into video games when video games were really hitting their stride, we're now entering our 30s, our 40s, even older than that. And we're still playing video games because that is the pastime that we resonate with. Our parents, our grandparents, they had to do different things the past time when they were kids or teenagers, etc. But us, our, our, my generation, nah, video games. That's just how it is. I mean, I can't think of too many ways, too many more entertaining ways to pass time than video games. You know? You get sucked into it, and then the time, it just melts away. 
At any rate, though, yeah, this is a nice little throwback level. The best level in Rainbow Resort might be the best level in the game. It's certainly the most memorable. And yeah, the hidden switch is right there. Actually, I think there's only a hidden switch in the first and last level in this world. Again, I wasn't paying too, too much attention, but... At any rate, that's going to wrap up Rainbow Resort. All that's left is to take on the final boss. Right? Right? Yeah. So in Kirby Dream Land, the only game that preceded Kirby's Adventure, you'd fight, you fought King DD as the final boss. And it's a similar story here. I say similar. So in Kirby Nightmare and Dream Land only, they actually do a different music track. They actually pull in the Fountain of Dreams song from Super Smash Bros. Melee, if I'm not mistaken. Not like a direct rip, but they like do a remix of it in the GBA sound font and all that, I think. Also, for some reason, Laser does really good against DDD here, and he flinches every time you attack him, it seems like. It's kind of kind of crazy, actually. But, okay, I got hit once. I don't think I was going for no damage, obviously, but jeez, look at this. He takes a little damage from the laser, but because he keeps flinching, I'm just able to decimate him, really. Oh! And then I finish him with the star spit. Epic, epic cheese, man. But the game doesn't end here. It says level eight, don't let it fool you. That's just, you're not gonna go through another full world with five or six levels or whatever. Look at the video link. Do you really think we have enough time for that? It's just kind of the second, hat, it's the second act of the Fountain of Dreams, or Rainbow Resort, I should say. Because the Fountain of Dreams is part of that. Although, Fountain of Dreams did get a stage in Super Smash Bros. Melee, which is pretty cool. At any rate, though, King DDD recognizes that there's a greater evil, and helps you out. And so, this was my first final boss sequence in a Kirby game, and I have a lot of fond memories of this. You're just, like, fighting a giant orb that's shooting projectiles at you, and you're using a Star Rod to do the same thing back. This boss fight does kind of stall a little bit. But I think it actually works to its advantage, atmospherically speaking. I think this is actually one of the better final boss sequences in the series. Honestly, like, the, the one in Kirby 64 is also pretty good, but honestly, that one is mostly because of the music. In here, it's just, it's not even so much the music, it's just the way things progress. You think the game is over after you defeat DDD, especially if you had played Dreamland before. I didn't, but still. You would think that Didi King Dedede would be it, but no, you get to this, and you think this is it, but no, that's just phase one. Anyways, say hello to the Nightmare, NME, Nightmare Enterprises. Yeah, they were actually the bad guys of the anime, so maybe that's why they decided to market this remake to the anime, in, in tune with the anime to an extent, I don't know. I think the anime was like already almost a year old when this came out. But that's besides the point. So anyway, final actual fight of Kirby's Adventure, Kirby Nightmare Dreamland. Nightmare Sprite in the in the NES version is very scary. It's not as scary here, but honestly, it's still a great design. Vaguely reminds me of like Dick Dastardly or Waluigi. Now I'm just kidding. Waluigi's chin doesn't go in that hard. At any rate. You do damage to Nightmare by waiting for his robe to be exposed, and you gotta hit his, like, tornado-shaped body with your Star Rod. But now, you're not fighting like you were during the ball form. You're fighting on the ground. Now, the ground is constantly moving, so you do have to worry about that. And sometimes, you won't get a good shot with your Star Rod because the Nightmare is moving around a lot, and you're also kind of moving around, and you gotta fly and worry about hovering and all that, so I'm trying to go for these, like, frame one hits by throwing my stars in advance so that I hit Nightmare right when it's opening his road, you know what I mean? Which isn't always easy to do. For the record, I think hitting with the actual star rod also counts, but I prefer the projectile. At any rate, that takes care of that, everybody. So... I sincerely hope you enjoyed my nostalgic revisit. Oh yeah, and I got 100%, of course. I hope you enjoyed my nostalgic revisit of the remake of the first Kirby game that I ever played. 
It's just a nice, quick little two-parter. Hopefully, it'll be a nice, like, schedule filler or something like that. I don't know. I hope you, you all enjoyed this for what it is. And next time that I visit the Kirby series, it is for sure going to be Let's Play Kirby and the Forgotten Land for the Nintendo Switch. And after that, I, since Return to Dream Land is coming out on Switch, that might be a pretty good follow-up, too. It's a really good game. It would be a really good follow-up to this in particular since it's a 2D... Well, 2.5D, but you get the point. So, yeah, the future of Kirby's looking bright in general, and the future of Kirby Let's Plays are looking pretty bright, too. I do want to point out that I do prefer live commentary for the most part, because it's mostly an easier editing process, but sometimes if it's a game that I can't otherwise do live because I don't have it on Switch or any other home console, uh, I will do post-commentary for, like, emulator stuff here and there, so... Fluff up your pillow and get ready for a good night's sleep. That sounds like a good idea. I'm going to go ahead and cut recording here. I hope you guys enjoyed it. And yeah, next time, don't forget about me.